Looking for Boaz, a candid conversation with single Gen X men on life, love, and the pursuit of happiness. Ladies, can you handle the truth? Do you have what it takes to be Ruth? Welcome to Looking for Boaz. Let's welcome Tony to the show today. Hey, Tony. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm good. How you doing? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. Thank you. You good? You don't know, you don't know none of the questions? How you feel about that? <laughs> hey, I'm here. I'm ready. Okay, so let's go. Let's get this thing popping. So let's go with question number one. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with your mother and your father. They were married for over 50 years. So, you know, I come from, you know, a, a nuclear family setting, so to speak. Um, yeah, there are 10 of us. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm very, I'm very family oriented. I'm, I was always very close to my mother. She passed away in 2018. Um, uh, my dad, he's still here. I'm very close with him. Um, but they always played two, I guess, different dynamic roles. But um, for me personally, I think the best thing about, you know, being raised by both of my parents was it showed me how a successful relationship can work. And the sacrifices that you may have to make. And, you know, I think it better prepared me for, you know, I guess adulthood, my adulthood as a man trying to, you know, be a provider and, and be the right type of person in a relationship. Oh, I love that. Listen, ladies, he came from a two parent household. Remember, we always think black men all come from the streets. They ain't had a father in their life. So I just want people to understand the dynamic that mm -hmm. some black men did have their father in their life. Some black men have seen healthy marriages. Some, you know, right. and, and we have to break that that stereotype up that all black men from the streets didn't know their father, mother and father did this and did that. So he came from a two parent home. So this is right. gonna be very interesting. What are your top three core values? In a woman? No, yours. Oh, just my core. Well, um, one is definitely uh, integrity. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very big on integrity. Like, you know, you know, say what you mean, do what you say, you know, being trustworthy. So those types of things, you know, as a man, you know, my word is my bond anyway. You know, that's just how I was brought up. So I'm, I'm not from that school of, you know, just say whatever you got to say to just get what you want and keep it moving. No, integrity is what's matter is, is what really matters. Um, another thing is uh, honesty. I mean, they're related, but honesty is a very big, big, big deal for me. Um, like I, I, it makes I almost feel sick when I'm around a, a liar. Like I really, that's something that I really detest. You know, I don't know, maybe it's just because, you know, you know, once again, back to my parents, like they were very honest. They were always been very honest. You know what I'm saying? I like to know what I'm dealing with from, from the beginning. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think it's kind of childish to just to lie. It doesn't really make sense. And um, what else? You said another core value is uh, family. <laughs> I'm I, I'm very 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 big on family, on my my siblings, my my close friends, and especially my children. Like they're the most important thing for me. So I think you know when 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 when, you, when I talk about family, I'm just talking about um, just the togetherness, the nurturing, that type of of element. You mm -hmm. know, I'm very very protective of my family, and so you know I, I just feel that family is always going to come first, no matter what, and you know, that's where I draw the basis of who I am. Okay. What is the biggest turnoff when it comes to a woman? Insecurity. Oh. And, and that insecurity is usually displayed in the overt uh, <laughs> behavior that, that where women, they, they tend to always be like, I'm not, listen, I'm not disparaging anybody right now, right? But, no, you're just speaking your truth. Okay. Well, as a man of a certain age, I'm I'm 49 years old. You know, I done, I played around, I did everything I had to do, but I think it, it becomes very obvious when a woman is insecure 
And sometimes their behavior can translate as desperate by always seeking attention, you know, with the as far as the superficial things or objectifying yourself too much. Like me, honestly, it turns me off. Like even social media lately, it just really turns me off because you can go on Instagram, Facebook, wherever it is, and all you see are half naked women. I mean, every picture that a woman takes, every selfie, every video, you know, they got can I curse? Not not curse, but they got their ass as the main character in every every selfie, every picture. And that's actually a turnoff. Like, like men, well, men like me, most men I know, we're not really, that's not really what we're looking for. I mean, unless you're looking for like a little side piece to just do whatever you're doing. But it's just that when you do that, it's kind of like displaying yourself like, like a meat market almost. You know what I'm saying? And I think a lot of women, they get so, they get it confused where they think that um, this sexual freedom and objectification of yourself somehow translates to, to empowerment. And it doesn't. It, it really doesn't. And to many men, especially like men like myself, um, who are secure in who they are and know who they are and want a woman who knows who she is, it comes off as desperate and, you know, kind of pathetic. Mm, 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 mm. Tony come up in here stepping on people's toes, stepping oh, on their stilettos, <laughs> stepping on their BBLs. Come on now. No, we're here because there is a miss with um, Gen X men and Gen X women. There's a miss with women between the ages of 42 and 57 mm -hmm. and men between the ages of 42 and 57. Relationships are not lasting. Um, men of that age are going to younger women, 35, 40 years old. You know why I think sometimes too? I think a lot of times, like, listen, I always like older women, which is weird, right? And even as a 49-year-old, I can't even see myself with anyone younger than, honestly, probably like 45, you know? Like, I like grown women. You got to look like a grown woman. <laughs> like, that's just what I always wanted. But I think one of the reasons why you may see certain men kind of going and dealing with those other women is twofold. One, because it's it's easier. I hate to say it that way, but it's 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 easier, and it kind of relates to the things that I was speaking about previously, where this new approach to relationships and dating is is more like a transaction. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So sometimes it's kind of like you know, nice and simple, almost like you know, here, here you go, man, <laughs> whatever. Because you know, we know what. A lot of these younger women are looking for, and we know what a lot of the older men are looking for. So it just becomes transactional. But another reason why I think so many men are kind of defaulting to these younger women is because they see women in our age bracket trying to mimic these younger women and make fools of themselves. And it's a turnoff. Like you can't get to a certain stage in your life and start acting like some, some young millennial or, or, or whatever it is and expect for a grown ass man to take you seriously. We're not looking for that, especially if we're trying to build a future with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ladies, I, right. I really just want us to listen to the brother. I don't want us to twist his words. I don't want us to oh, make Lord. something that so is I'm, not... I'm a little inflammatory then. It doesn't no, 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 right no, no, no. No, no, I'm just saying it's because when we get together in groups of women, mm -hmm. men tell us stuff and we switch it to what we want to hear. We say things yes. like, oh, he didn't mean that. You know, he said he don't want a baby. Yes. When y'all get married, if you know, once you get married or once y'all get serious, y'all could talk about it again. No. Yeah. Tony said what he said. Let, let us digest it. That's actually another thing I kind of wanted to mention. That's another thing that I would say is a turn off for men is when we try to communicate and you either don't listen to us, ignore us, or you try to remix what we're saying or interpret and translate it into something else. You know, nobody likes being ignored. No one appreciates not being listened to. So that's very frustrating for men. And that's kind of an age old story. You know, I think as a society, we've grown to somewhat underestimate or undervalue and not take seriously a man's need to be 
acknowledged and recognized and even to feel needed and valuable. And, you know, while I think it's great, you know, where women are so empowered nowadays and they're doing so well, but I think sometimes that quote unquote un empowerment translates into, into a domineering type of behavior. Whereas you don't value the man's input, especially in relationships. And then you'll find those guys that just kind of sit back and shut up like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm not even going to argue, you know, and honestly, that's not the type of guy that you want. You really don't want your man to kind of default to, oh, uh, it's all right. You got it. Go ahead, babe. Like, I'm not even going to question it or argue with it. Like, that's really not the type of person that you want, because to me, that translates to more of, I give up. I don't care. I'm not going to invest enough of myself into this. So I would, you know, my suggestion would be to listen more because I really love to listen. You know, the, the person that I choose to be with that I, you know, I want to invest my time with, like, I know, I want to know what I'm getting. <laughs> you know, when you go shopping, you look in the grocery store, you want to know what you're getting. You want to pick up the vegetables. You're going to look at it to see if it's too ripe or whatever. So we got to do the same thing. So, you know, you got to listen. Don't try to mold men into whatever interpretation that sometimes your girlfriends might tell you or you think that men are supposed to be. Because sometimes we end up looking at relationships too much from the perspective of what we can get as opposed to what we can offer. Oh, wee! I'm enjoying this already. We ain't even nowhere near through. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Let me just get to the next question, because ladies, we getting some we getting some tea tonight. I mean, I'm sorry, we getting some Hennessy tonight. Wait a minute, let me just put the tea to the side. Let me get us some more Hennessy. Get your shot glasses for this one. Mm. What are your fears when it comes to being in a committed relationship? Fears? Yes. I guess I'll go based on experience. Fears when in a committed relationship is, I would say not being able to give enough of my time. And, and it's not that I'm concerned that I won't be giving valuable time, but from my experience, you know, women are more emotional creatures, which is beautiful. That's great because they're supposed to offset men, you know, we're supposed to complement each other. But I also understand that women require a certain amount of attention. And I'm not saying that I'm not available to do that, but I think so often we focus more on the quantity as opposed to the quality of the time that is being invested. And that causes a serious problem, especially when you're dealing with a man who's really, let's say, um, dr work driven or entrepreneurial driven. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. So, you know, I, I, I work a lot. And, and contrary to popular belief, when you're an entrepreneur and you're self employed, you work you often work more hours than anybody that has a nine to five and sometimes even two jobs. And that can sometimes be very hard, uh, difficult for women to understand. But I understand it, you know, which is honestly probably why I'm single now, because, you know, every I would say that the, the, the relationships that I could have or should have been in that would have been great. I do know that the time that I was able to dedicate just didn't seem to be enough for my partner. And I don't want to ever get involved in a relationship with someone where I feel like I'm not giving them what they want. Now, even if I think what I'm giving you is, is sufficient and, I, and I'm seeing a bigger picture, I can't, you know what I'm saying? I, I can't, I don't want to hurt the person that I'm with, especially if they can't, if we're not I'm seeing eye to eye anyway. And that's another thing I think we underestimate that sometimes people, you're just not going to see eye to eye with someone. And it's better to just kind of walk away and let it go without trying over and over and over to like to beat a dead horse and force a situation that just doesn't need to happen. Um, I know I kind of ran my mouth a little bit. No, uh, no, that's how we're here. This is good. This is good stuff, right? Come on. <laughs> okay. I, and you said another fear. Um, Another fear about, you said for getting, getting in a committed relationship? Entering a committed relationship, what stops you 
we'll put like uh, I don't really have a fear. Okay. Just outside the, of that. Just the time. Honest. Okay. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. And and it's, it's probably because I think that it might sound corny, but I think that whenever you approach a, a, a new relationship, you should always approach it in, in a more optimistic um, manner. Because I think we're so overly cautious and not to say that caution is bad, but sometimes when you're so overly, overly cautious and hesitant, you find yourself not really giving everything that you're supposed to give to that relationship in order for that person to truly get to know you and understand you and know what they're getting. So then everybody's just kind of falling back and offering their representative. And then by the time, if you do make the decision to get with the person, you're meeting a stranger. And that's crazy. Wow, this is good. Um, let's talk about communication. What type of communicator are you? I'm, oh boy. See, I, I can say what they, <laughs> okay, when you say what type of communicator, do you mean like what you're talking about, like frequency? Like how do I communicate? Right, I mean, like text? Do, you, do you? I'm very open about my feelings. Do it. I'm, okay. I'm, yeah. Yep. I wear my heart on my sleeve 1000% and I'm not ashamed of it. I, I, I speak, I speak the truth as I know it. Um, I, I like to to be open about how I feel, and I try to get the person that I'm with to be the same way, because like I said, you know, like I said earlier, like you really want to know the person that you're dealing with. This is the the time we're supposed to be taking advantage of this time right now when we're getting to know each other. So you know, you, you got to be open. You got to be open and honest with each other. So me, yes, I'm a very good communicator on how I feel. But when it comes to frequency, I okay. know that's an issue. I know that's, listen, I know that's, that's an issue. Because maybe it's because I, like, if I feel secure with the person I'm with, see, I'm not a jealous type at all. So, like, if I don't hear, like, you know, say we're dating. Right. And I don't hear from you for, like, two days or three days. I'm not going to panic. And I'm not going to be, well, why didn't you call me? What's going on? That's, I don't have time. Come on, man. <laughs> Especially when you have a busy lifestyle. Like, we don't have time for that stuff. For me, that's like young people's stuff. Oh, okay, ladies. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. He might not call you for two or three days. Don't panic. Oh, Lord. Oh, yeah. Don't, but don't right. panic. He's busy. Right. And a lot of times women want a provider mm -hmm. and they want things. But if you want a man that's provider, a provider and productive, you're going to find, you're going to have a busy man. Right. You know? Now, if you want to, and it, there's no disrespect to any type of worker. Now, if you want somebody just with a regular nine to five, that's just, you know, a post office worker or a police officer or somebody in a service business or a white collar or a blue collar, then you have to know what you want. But I'm an entrepreneur too. So I get it. Sometimes I'm up in my computer. I don't know how a man will respond to me being up in my computer three, four o'clock in the morning. But sometimes that's what it is when I have stuff to do, proposals to write and all of that. Like I have right. a deadline, so I'm up. So I get it. But for the women who are listening, if you're going to deal with an entrepreneur or someone who um, owns a, a, a major business and has employees and things of that nature, you're going to deal with a busy man. But I think that's why it's, it's, it's really essential to get with someone that you have things in common with, where you're kind of equally yoked because it's kind of hard to explain this type of stuff and not in any disparaging way, but this, it's kind of hard to explain these types of things properly to a person that doesn't live the type of lifestyle that you live. Like you, you know, you, you'll see like celebrities, like actors and stuff, dating actors, because they, they have a similar lifestyle, similar schedules. They know what it, it is. They know what it calls for. So, so even me, myself as a, as a, as a, an entrepreneur, I understand. And also as a parent, because that's a very big, big role in my life, straight mm -hmm. up and down. You know, I'm, I'm a single parent. Um, you know, my children are everything to me. So you don't accept my kid? Nah. That, mm, I didn't even, know men, I didn't yeah. even know men dealt with that. How old are your children? Um, well, my youngest is, is 14 now. Okay. Yeah, he just turned 14. He's in high school. And my daughters are 
they grown now. <laughs> okay. Yes. We yeah. we at that age where our kids is grown, which is crazy when you think about like, oh my goodness, yeah. I have a 27 year old. What? Wait a minute. Yeah, I, I have a 27 year old, my daughter. I have a 27 year old son. And I'm like, what? I was just 27. Like what happened? Mm-hmm. When did I get 52? I'm not understanding this, but it's a wonderful life because we did all the craziness and now we're in another, we're on right. another level. Most of us. And we look great, especially Gen X's. I don't know what it is about Gen X's, but we are like the 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 best, youngest, like freshest, best preserved <laughs> generation <laughs> of all. Looking younger than the kids, our kids. <laughs> he said what he said, and it's the truth. Because I'm looking at him, he's looking at me, and we both look good. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're going to go to our next question. When it comes to women, what's the biggest problem with communicating? From, from their angle, not yours of, you know, what you explained about yourself, or what's the problem when you come in contact with a woman, Gen X women, and their communication? The problem with them? Yes. Their problem? Yes. Not listening um, is a big one, because not listening can can translate in several ways. One can be them not really valuing what you have to say and somewhat diminishing your voice, but it can also be them not listening what you have to say because of their own insecurities and their fears of losing you or or not being good enough, or they kind of hear what they want to hear. And that's, I'm telling you, that's one of the biggest issues that men, that Gen X men have when dealing with Gen X women is communication. I'm telling you, it's communication. I think that's one of, that's the biggest barrier. And unfortunately, I think that a lot of our women, they are not willing to hold themselves accountable for their lack of communication skills when it comes to our men. And that and and, and that's just real. Because and I and I get it, society tells you, you know certain things especially about black men see i'm talking about black men and black women that's what we're talking about right here right and and i think that black men and women we have so much gender politics that has been infused into our our dynamic our our community and family dynamic that we have allowed that to supersede what was innately ours as a black family Mm. and 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 i think a lot of that is you know from outside entities coming in and trying to tell us or liken our issues to theirs when it really isn't, you know, historically, you know, black men and women have always had a symbiotic relationship with each other. And, you know, the, the breakdown of communication is something that you honestly see more so in Western society. And we know where a lot of that stuff originated, especially here in the United States, but communication is, one of the most important things. And I would just really hope that some of our women would really be more invested in holding themselves accountable for their role. And this is the thing, you know, I, I should be able to tell you that, listen, you, you know, your slip is hanging. Listen, you, you messing up right now. Come on, fix this without you, you know, going on the attack or being defensive. So, so I think with that willingness to communicate and hold yourself accountable, that cannot be divorced from humility. And we're in a society today where everyone seems to be deprived in, in, in their ability to be humble. Ooh, humility, come on now. We going into the, we getting into the good stuff right now. Let's talk about how, how do you deal with anger? Um, how do I deal with it? Uh, for the longest time, I held it in. But through life experiences, I realized how harmful that could be. But now I think, you know, whenever I'm angry, I like to talk. I like to talk about it. Still, there are times where I might keep it to myself, but that's really not a good idea. You know, I've I've gone to counseling, like I've gone to therapy, and I know that's taboo, you know, in the black community especially. But I'm telling you, therapy works. 
there, there's nothing to be ashamed of, you know? Because therapy is really just s- someone for you to talk to, let it all out. You know, maybe the people that you're used to communicating with, they just, you know, they're not, they don't, they're not really the right types to listen or whatever. But therapy is more about you discovering you. So a therapist is not going to lay it all out and say, no, you do this, because that's the problem. Sometimes we're so busy looking for guidance and direction from someone else that we're not even figuring out that we got all the answers ourselves. And most of the time, it's just about figuring out who we are and how we've been handling things and just try to figure out how to better navigate our responses to quite often things that are outside of our control. So a lot of times the approach to therapy should be more one of just trying to uh, maybe an analytical approach to just figure things out. So you're not so caught up in like, Oh my God, therapist, am am I crazy? If people saying it's like, no, it's it's not that at all. And it's very useful. And it's more about self-awareness. Yes. That's That's exactly what it's about. Yes. Yeah. Figuring out who you are when you Mm -hmm. come into the equation, as opposed to, like you said, what can I get from this person? Or what are you giving? Like, what are you give? Not only giving, I mean, not materialistic, but what are you giving off when you walk into a relationship? And this is so important because that was one of my questions, but you're ahead of me. So that's good to know that you don't have a problem with therapy. Because And, and it, be- it better equips you to deal with other people and to relate to other people. And, and trust me, I needed it because, you know, you know, I, I'm one of those people that had that, you know, the, the baby mama, baby daddy situation. So I, I just volunteered to go and do it just in order to create, to figure out how I could make things better for my son. Oh, that's grown, grown right there. Yeah. That's grown. Let me figure this out because I'm not going to be nowhere arguing and screaming with nobody. Let me learn how to control myself, figure out how I right. can when buttons are pushed, what I need to do, you know, that that's what therapy is about. But a lot of times people think from the way we were raised, like you right. go to therapy, you're crazy. No, if you don't go to therapy, you're crazy. That That's the real key if you don't go. So career, talk a little bit about your career and where you see yourself in five years. Um. Well, career wise, I mean, I, I kind of do a lot. Um, I'm, I'm a, I've been a, a real estate investor for, damn, it's been almost 20 years. Yeah, it's been almost 20 years. Um, but I also uh, invest in various uh, business ventures in order to diversify my portfolio and create you know, multiple streams of income. But I'm also a filmmaker as well. And you know, I have a movie that's out now playing on Fox. So Where Hearts Lie, if you ever get a chance, please go see it. Um, so yeah, there, there. And another funny thing, I'm a tra- I'm a barber by trade, and I'm a damn good barber. And I think I'm probably gonna open like a couple of shops soon too, because you know I'm very goal oriented, and I know, and I know how some people say, oh, master, what, what do they say, jack of all trades, master of none. none. But I really am a jack of all trades, and I'm really good at the stuff that I do. So <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of hard, you know what I'm saying. I mean, I'm also a contractor, you know, I'm an electrician, a plumber. So I do, I do a lot, you know, but I, I am at the phase in my life where I'm, I'm trying to uh, take things to where I'm more so delegating so I can kind of sit back and just collect now. Cause you know, mm. I ain't trying to beat myself up too long. Mm. Sit back and collect. That's what I'm talking about. Collect. But I believe in working hard as hard as you can now while you're young. So you don't have to work so hard later. And I'm almost at my later. So in five years from now, I'm definitely going to be retired and I'm going to be a well into a multimillionaire. Definitely. Okay. Mm. Well, listen here. Let me just throw my little towel into the ring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you ladies. I'm messing with y'all. Listen, I'm going to share all this information. I ain't going to save this video for myself. Y'all just calm down. Be easy. <laughs> I'm just playing. So... Why did your last relationship end? Ooh. <laughs> no holes barred, huh? <laughs> um, now, I asked you if anything was off limits. You said no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. Um, 
because I'm going to try to be as politically correct as possible. Um, it, it did not work because the person I was with was, uh, damn, I think I, the only thing I can say, that, that she felt too much competi competition between herself and my kid. And, oh. and I believe, oh man, am I going to get real here? All right. Yes. Come on. Okay. It, it, hold on a second. Okay. Well, the last like relationship relationship that I was in was with my, my son's mom and um, everything was great honestly, until he was born. And some people try to say, you know, maybe it was postpartum and things of that nature, but I really don't believe that's what it was. Um, but unfortunately, you know, and this is what I mean when you, when I talk about two people, you know, being unequally yoked, you know, I'm a certain type of person with a different, a certain type of background. And she is one that has a specific type of background. And maybe in her prior relationships, you know, physicality was okay. Not for me. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it, it's it's sad to say, but sometimes some women they they want to keep a man so much that they're willing to do anything, including having children for that man, believing that giving birth to his child is going to guarantee that you guys are going to be together forever and ever. Now, now this is not in any way to talk about, you know, the man, but I want to say that that shouldn't be your reason for having a child to keep a man. And sooner or later that will be revealed in the relationship and no one's going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. He's not going to be happy. And the child is not going to be happy. So, you know, that's probably, I think that'll be the best way I can say it. But I will say this, if you watch my movie, I can tell you that it's, it's largely based on my life, loosely based on my life without really divulging too much. I, I'll probably have to say that. Oh, awesome. Because yeah. again, like I said, when I sent the description to you that we're here to, you know, support your platform too. So I want everybody to go and watch the movie. So we'll give that information at the end as well. And I'll put okay. it in the description when we um, air this as well, because I want people to see that you're doing great things. Like I really do. I really believe that if we stick together as yeah. black men and women, mm -hmm. we can conquer the world. If we could just get over, like I said, whatever this miss is, mm -hmm. we need to get it together so that we can take over the world. Cause the Gen Xers, like we really had a different, we were in between the baby boomers who are rigid, not willing to right. change, and between the millennials who are just really out of their mind, think they could do anything, sense of entitlement. And I say that because I have a millennial that I turned right. into that by giving too much because there you go. I didn't there. have anything. So right. when I got, I just was like, I, why should he struggle? My mom didn't have, I just, I'm right. give, but it gave him a sense of entitlement, entitlement and it yeah. didn't make him responsible or he had no skin in the game. So he's never felt lost. He, you know, he never went without toilet paper. He never went without a meal. He never, um, he, he never struggled period. So, right. and I'm not, I'm just saying we in between that when we were growing up, we had parents that worked. So we had a sense of independency to come home, do our homework, clean up the kitchen before mom got home. Mm -hmm. we, we had a sense of a fellowship with our friends. We walked halfway to meet our friend. We walked through the snow. We rode our bike. Right. This we is an entitled generation all around. Yes. And we're seeing it. Honestly, I'm seeing it with, with, with Gen X is a little bit too. But, you know, I got a Gen Xer. You know what I'm saying? But I'm I'm wringing that out of him. <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? So I think we can we can fix it by bridging the gap with these generations. Because I honestly think that Gen X is in the pocket. That's that generation that has enough wisdom and enough uh, uh, flexibility, cool, cool, right? Flexibility and coolness where they yes. can still affect real change across all generations. We're the bridge 
between all of those generations. That's and we awesome. have a lot of knowledge and, 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 and a lot of information that we can bring together and we can utilize to just kind of bring us out of the mess that we're all in as a society today. I know that's right. That's why I started the New You Nation Network, the network for Generation X. That's to right. To put our content out there for people to see what we have. Like we're, the millennials right. want us to shut up. Yeah, you're doing this too much. The baby boomers, like I said, they so rigid, they stuck in their ways. This is what I'm doing. This is how I was raised, you know, 60 up. I don't care. And we just like, wait a minute, let's do this. Let's create some flows of ink, some um, streams of income. Let's be entrepreneurs. Let's love everybody. Let's not judge. But we have to get our voices back out there. And that's why I appreciate that, too. You know, with you building this platform, because I remember when I saw when you announced it and I was I was very happy because um, Gen Xers, like we're really, I think Gen X, and I'm not just trying to, you know, blow us up on it, but like, but I think Gen Xers have the greatest amount of value to contribute to finding solutions today. However, we have been relegated to a position where our voices are not really heard. So I think it's, it's really important that platforms like yours and others really need to be built up in order to provide that voice because if no one can can hear what we're saying no one can really benefit from the information and we have a lot of valuable perspective to offer so you know i commend you oh thank you but that's why i mean if we could have these that's why i want us to have these healthy conversations instead of us talking at each other i want to listen to you i want you to listen to me without objection without I'm listening to respond, whether or not I'm listening to learn from you what your truth is, not what I want your truth to be. Because again, like you said with your son's mother, y'all grew up in totally different lenses. That that's a problem if we don't have these conversations. Like my ex-husband, right. he was raised in a traditional home with both his parents. It was 13 of them, 13 kids, mm. mother, father, the father worked, the mother never worked, the mother didn't drive. Okay. Very traditional, the mom cooked. My, I came from a dysfunctional background. My mom was a single mom. She had drug and alcohol problems. My aunties was, my, I said I was raised by wolves because my aunts didn't play. They would knock you out when the Johnny Walker Red came out in the cards. So mm. when me and him got together and he was trying to provide structure. Oh, like, you, were sticking you weren't ready for that. You didn't want right? to I was like, that. wait a minute, we can not have a party. He was like, not on a Tuesday. I was like, because I was used to, dysfunction was normal for me. So right. we do have to make sure we are equally yoked. And if we're not, we have to make sure we have these hard conversations in yeah. order to see what I'm able to tolerate yeah. and what he was able to tolerate. Because we were we had we started a business which was very lucrative. And then we got a house with a pool. So I wanted everybody to come over in the pool. It's Wednesday Eve, Wednesday. He come home from work. He didn't work 17 hours because we had our own business. And he like people in the house. I mean, hot dogs on the grill. It's Wednesday, the middle of the, he like, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm like, yeah, what's up? He like, can't be doing this on Wednesday, Trey. I'm like, we got a pool. So it caused some yeah. friction and he was real lenient, but I just wasn't getting it. So our relationship ended because of me. I, I committed adultery because he was working all the time. And again, I was immature. I didn't know how to articulate what I wanted. So there was a crack in our door. And when the man came along, I jumped on it. So that's how I began my platforms of explaining to people, you have to grow up hmm. to say, why and do hold yourself cheat? accountable. Wow. That's, yes. People say, why do people cheat? cheat Trey? I, I cheated because I was immature in communication. And anytime anybody cheats, it's because they're immature. Their excuse may be different. It might be money. It might be communication. It might be sex. But the reason why you go out on somebody in a relationship because you're immature, because you have the right to make a decision to walk away before you do something that you know you have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, yes. And I literally did that. Like I was in a relationship with a person and I told her, Listen, listen, like, I was actually starting to develop like feelings for somebody else. And I didn't feel right. Like even right. being in a relationship, if, like if I feel like I'm going to cheat, because I'm not going to cheat. So right. I just had to tell her like, listen, I don't think that this is working because I would never want to disrespect you like that. And I just think, you know, we should move our separate ways. Not too many people are going to say that. Not too many people are going to step up and do that. But 
I would actually respect that even more, to be yeah. honest. You know, yeah. I rather know an, an inconvenient truth or, or, or a truth that hurts me than a lie that's going to, you know, keep me happy and ignorant. Right. And that's what I say. Truth hurts, but lies damage. Right. You know, but unfortunately, with- we like to, you know, unfortunately, in relationships today, we tend to prefer lies. A sugar coating. Just, just as long as it makes us feel good, then that's it. We're, we're, we'll just remain in a state of denial. And we got to get out of that denial and start to face reality so we can figure out how to make things like truly work. Yes. Yes, but we're going to get us there. That's why that's why we're here, because these are the conversations that we really need to be having without fear, because what's for you is for you. So this next question, mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't have to answer it. So far, everybody has. No pressure. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> How old were you when you lost your virginity? Oh. Oh, that's nice. I was, I was 17. Okay. Yeah, I was 17. Okay. That's fair. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I asked that question because I think it's important for us to know when each person has lost their virginity, because if I'm going to get into a relationship with you and you tell me you lost your virginity at 11, I need to know why, because there was some trauma there. That's trauma. Right. Because a 11 year old should have lost their virginity or, you know, 12, whatever, you know, 15, 16, we like, you know, I start, we started girl, boys, they start liking each other, kissing each other, and we go, or 17, we at the prom. But I asked that question because I think it's relevant for us to ask each other those questions. Like, Trey, well, you know, how old were you when you lost your virginity? If I tell you I was 11, there's something, that's going to show up if you don't know. Yeah. And if I haven't dealt with that, that's going to show up in my relationship. So I think there's some important questions that we need to ask each other. And I'm not just asking that question so we can laugh. No, I I agree. I mean, my movie actually deals with unresolved trauma, which I think is something that is a huge part of our relationship dynamic in the Black community. There's a lot of unresolved trauma, which leads to so much of the dysfunction that we see today. We Mm -hmm. don't even have any idea. We don't even realize how something that happened when we were five, six years old can translate to the person that we are today in our 40s or 50s. Yes, if we have ignored it and buried it. Right, if it has not been resolved or dealt with. Right, yep. So when we have these real conversations as 42 to 57 and beyond, we should be able to have conversations. And if you can't have, I think that if I ask the person a question and we can't have that hard conversation now, Mm -hmm. then we'll never be able to have it then. Right. So That's that's important for us. So you answered the question, do you go to therapy or have you gone? So I'm so happy to hear that therapy is good for you. Yeah, now, good. on a lighter note, what's your favorite meal? My favorite meal? Oh, it's probably some variation of salmon. Okay. Yeah, I love salmon. I love to cook okay. salmon. I love to eat salmon. Oh, yeah, I know how to cook, by the way. I get busy. Oh, okay. I get busy in, in the kitchen. Oh, ladies, mm-hmm. listen here. Do you need a woman that cooks? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's fair. What type of music do you listen to? r and I'm an R&B dude. I used to, you know, I used to sing r and I used to like work in the music industry, producing and, and singing and stuff like that and vocal arrangement. Oh. But I'm R&B. Um, actually, I like all types of music, though, to be honest with you. R&B, hip hop, jazz, yeah, definitely jazz, gospel, um, um, pop, some rock. Yeah, I, I, I like all types of music. Opera. But R&B, but yeah. R&B is more your go-to. But R&B is, I guess, my lane. Yeah, R&B is my lane. That, it's always been my lane. But I'm a, I'm a musician first, so it's, it's just about music. I just love music. Yes. Very Me musical too. person. Yeah, yeah me too. I'm just a very creative person, which is a whole nother level of craziness to a person who doesn't, who's not creative. <laughs> They're like, girl, you got too many ideas. Oh, trust me. I understand it. I understand. Yeah. I'm like, I got another show. I got another, my friends be like, yo, I'd be like, see, you don't understand. It's in my, I got to get it out of my head on paper. So 
and I used to write songs. So oh. songs, poems, like it's just a lot of creativity up upstairs. So that's why entertainment is my first love, like right. at everything. So same, same, you know. Yeah. So that's my default. I started writing songs. Well, I started writing poetry. I draw, but you know, it was mostly like poetry. And then I was writing a book. I, I love to write. But when I was actually writing a book, and that's a friend of mine, she's a television producer, and she convinced me to translate the book, to transform it into a screenplay. And that's how, like, the idea for my movie was born. Oh, I love it. Well, we yeah. got to talk after this, because we we going to do some stuff. Okay. Um, what do you do for fun? Um, well, I'm in New York, and we're locked down, so, you know... I mean, when the lockdown is over or before. I mean, I, I like to do a lot of stuff, to be honest with you. Like, I, 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 okay, I like to be, I like simple things too, like going to the movies, like little lounge, but I love things like, like, like hanging out in the park, the beach. I love the beach. Like, I like to go like jet skiing. I like uh, parasailing. I like, um, I just, I like to do a lot of things. I, maybe really? because I'm getting older and I'm just like, man, let me just go and do it. I'm not going to do bungee jumping though, like stuff like that. Nah, that's, that's crazy stuff. I'm not doing that, but oh. I like to do things. I love to travel. That's probably my number one thing. I love okay. to travel. I okay. love going someplace new. I can go by myself, you know, whatever, but I just love to experience the world. Okay. What's, what is your take on God? I believe in God. I was raised, I mean, I was raised, my father, he's, he's a pastor, you know, um, my mother was the mother of the church. So, you know, I was raised in a Christian home. Um, I don't, I don't know if I identify as a Christian, honestly, but I do believe in God and a higher power. And, you know, my father used to always tell me, he always said, listen, you know, God, know God for yourself. That's how he always said it. So, I wouldn't say that I subscribe particularly to a specific denomination or whatever, because personally, I think that religion can be pretty much what's wrong with, you know, faith and our relationship with God, you know, but yeah, I definitely believe in God and I raise my children that way as well. Wow. I like that. No God for yourself. That's, that is a nugget right there. No God for yourself. And most of the lessons that the, I'm sorry, and most of the, the, the most valuable lessons that I received in my life came from like scripture. And, you know, so. Yes. Yeah. Again, I tell people all the time, it's not that churchy churchy. If you just know the Ten Commandments, it's just saying, just be a good human being. Right. <laughs> right. Don't, don't go kill nobody. Right. Don't sleep with nobody's wife or husband. Like if you just, it's just really like gives you boundaries as opposed to if we went out here and there was no stop signs no traffic lights right we would all be crashing into each other we need something right to keep us in line morally to say don't do that right right we all know right from wrong so that's all any religion really all have the same message of right treat people the way you want to be treated be a good human being yeah it's all pretty much the same theme all around <laughs> we just make it so wide and crazy like oh you go to church you know, I don't go all the time, but I do believe that we should be good people. Right. So what is your definition of love? Love is um, nurturing, covering, protection, um, placing, being able to place someone above yourself. Um, and feeling a sense of, I guess, honor in being able to participate in their lives. Oh, oh, you're killing me right now. Okay. What's your purpose? My purpose is to change the world. My purpose is to impact uh, real change in the people that I come across, which is probably why I am really so invested in my filmmaking because I want to make a real impact. And you know, I, everything I do is to try to educate, try to help, try to inspire, and you know, 
you know, I, you know, I volunteer as a teacher, you know, I, I volunteer as a, as a speech and debate teacher, just because I like to, to not only just teach, but I love to see, I don't know, like if you've ever like taught a child, even your own child. And when you see that moment, when you see something click and they, like yeah. they really understood it, that's so exciting to see, you know, that you were trying to get it, you're trying to explain it. And then when you see it, it click you know that you had a part, you played a role in changing that person's life. And I just feel like my purpose is to, like, not to sound corny, but to create a better world. And I think a large part of that is in speaking the truth as I know it and trying to show people their value because far too, too often and far too long we've been convinced that we have no value in this society, especially as Black people. So I take it as as my as a as a calling, or it's my charge to hmm. to reveal to all of us, to reveal to my brothers and my sisters that you you matter, you are worth it, you are beautiful. Contrary to what society has told you, man, we are everything. I know that's right. Listen, pa pa pass the collection plate. Pass the collection plate. <laughs> what do you believe is your top two strengths? My top two strengths? Um, well, if I said, I, I, I guess it would, it, I guess would it be my integrity? Like, like if I, my word is my bond. Like that's one thing people know. If I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And, and my, I guess my sense of charity, I am always available to give and to help and, and to, to teach. And, you know, I, I'm the guy that everybody calls, like when they, when they need help with something, unfortunately, sometimes that can be a little bit excessive when you're the one that everybody calls when they need help, you're the go-to, but yeah. you know, that, I guess that just comes with it, you know? I feel like that's just part of my calling to help people. So, mm -hmm. yeah, my word. So I guess my integrity, mm -hmm. you know, my integrity and my willingness to to help, my sense of charity. Mm. That's yeah. good. That's good stuff. And passion. Now, what do you, action? Passion. Oh, yeah. passion. Okay. Yeah. Passion. I like that, too. What do you believe are your top two weaknesses? I don't want to say weaknesses. Let's say what... What are your two okay. top areas of where you feel like you have room to grow? Hmm. Well, I think we all have room to no. Let me now. Let me fix that. Forget what we all do. Now, I'm going to talk about myself. That's right. That's what we're here for. <laughs> where do I need to grow? Is admitting when I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Think, cause, yeah, because sometimes when you're used to being right all the time, it's hard <laughs> to admit when you're wrong. And I, I know that sounded bad. <laughs> I know it sounded bad. <laughs> and uh, what's the other area? Um, forgiveness. Oh. I'm still a work in progress on that. And, you know, before my mother died, you know, I, I got a lot better just from my mother. You know, before she died, you know, I was going through some real serious stuff with my son's mother. And I'm talking about it was bad. Mm -hmm. And my mother said to me, actually, both my parents, they were so good at it. My mother, she said, Tony, um, you know, forgiveness it has nothing to do with her and everything to do with you. And and my father you know, he was going through something and, and I was like, daddy, now nah, you need to do this and you need to do that. How dare they? And, and he was like, but Tony, if, if, if I'm angry at them and I can't forgive them, then how can I help them? Mm. And that meant a lot. Like, trust me, that, that hit me. So. Wow. This is good. Forgiveness. Yeah. Yes. But you, but you're working on it. So yeah. Now we're going to get into do looks matter. Yes. Okay. Yeah, like don't let listen. No, don't let anybody lie to you and tell you that that looks don't matter. 
men are visual. Listen, we're a visual. We have to be, I got to be attracted to the person that I'm with. Now, I'm not saying that a person cannot grow to become physically attracted to someone the more they get to know them, because contrary to popular belief, you know, your beauty is not just in your physical appearance. However, it is a factor. So men like a woman that takes care of herself. Does that mean that you drown your face with makeup and this and then this? No, because honestly, we don't like that shit. I'm telling you that. I don't care that your eyelashes are two feet long and, and you got the, the foundation and all that stuff smeared on your face. And then I can't even identify you when you take that stuff off. So we're not, I'm not looking for that. Like we want to see you. You can be beautiful the way you are. That's what I'm saying. A lot of women don't understand. You are beautiful. It's black women, y'all are the shit. Y'all are beautiful. But this society is, t- you know what's crazy about black women? I know I'm going to start rambling. Like, like Oh, no, this is why we're ranting. here. But the crazy thing about black women, black women, is that society has modeled itself based upon beauty. They base their beauty standards today on black women. Right. Now, historically, the standard for beauty has always been a Eurocentric standard. However, even within those Eurocentric standards, you would see um, them caricaturizing themselves to mimic black women. You you ever see how the white European, like they had the the dresses with the big butts and this stuff? There's always been this, this, this um, fetishizing of black women. But when it comes to beauty, make no mistake, black women, it's all about you. So what disturbs me today, and a lot of brothers that I talk to about this, is that today's black women are mimicking white women who are mimicking black women. You're injecting yourselves and, and, and doing all types of stuff and, and dialing up. Your, you're doing all of this shit to look like white women who are trying to look like you. That's insanity to me. You're the default in beauty, black women. And I know a lot of y'all don't like to hear that. Listen, when you have your little gray hairs, I love it. Like, a lot of guys, we love it. Because just like how you say sometimes like grays can be distinguishing in, in men, it's the same for women. You know what I'm saying? Also, like you're here. Now, let me not get too crazy because then I know I'm going to offend people. Now, no, I'm just going to tell you the truth. No, you, you, go I'm ahead. Tell the truth. truth. Tell, Listen. tell the truth. Listen, I get it. You know, you like to do this stuff with your hair and the wigs and the this, that, and the other. But personally, I'll just say me personally. Yes. I prefer a natural beauty in a woman. Does it mean that when I see a woman dolled up and all of that other stuff that I won't find it attractive? It doesn't mean that at all. But here's the difference. A lot of the men, because whenever I I say this to women, you know, you don't need to do all of this and that. They say, well, yeah, but y'all like that. When you see that with these women, they wearing all of that, but y'all still liking their pictures on Instagram and you want those. But yeah, that's for sex. That's a play thing. Grown men like me, we're not looking for a plaything. Mm. So we don't want that to be, we don't want a wife that's looking like an Instagram th- dot or whatever. That's not what we want, you know? And listen, we like I said, men are visual creatures. Yes, we know that. So you don't know what a man like. Some men like skinny women, some men like thick women, some, like, you know, whatever. So you can't really control that. All you can control is how you take care of yourself. You're well groomed. You 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 know you take care of your skin. You know what men like? They like nice skin. They okay. like a woman who takes some care of her of her her weight. I'm being honest with you. Yes. Society teaches women today that they should glorify obesity, and I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Black women, y'all have beautiful curves. That's right. Mm, love it. But it doesn't, it shouldn't serve as an excuse to not take care of yourself. So, you know, men just like to see a woman who is com- confidence. Confidence is another thing that, that attracts us to you. That's, that's one of the biggest factors. I spoke about it earlier. 
insecurity is so transparent mm. and that insecurity is often displayed in the most salacious of uh, visual representations that we see all over the place. That's the insecurity that we see, but we're not attracted to that. We're attracted to women like Trey who can come on and she can wear a t-shirt and, and, a and a little one little earring or whatever got her hair done up and that's it that's what we like we well, like your you. confidence in being you and being a woman and being feminine yes yep. thank you well thank you for the compliment <laughs> I, was, I was a little bit having some trouble with my hair but okay we good, good. Okay. great we good now thank you yep. so much how engaged are you in sports um I mean like watching football and, and well, I, I stopped looking at football ever since the, the cabinet thing, but you know, I stuck to that. Like if I say I'm gonna do something, I do it. So oh, that's right. I look at some people crazy, like, wasn't y'all just boycotting that <laughs> the other day? <laughs> but me, I, I'm just too busy. Honestly, okay. I'm too busy. So I'm not like a heavy sports head and none of that stuff. You know, I'll play sports, but I'm not, you know, I'm not following all of these multimillionaires out there running up and down and I'm not making no money. I'm not making no money sitting around watching them. So I'd rather make my own money. I know that's right. Um, what do you think about women who smoke cigars? I don't like it. I, I'm not attracted. Me personally, I'm not attracted to women who smoke, period. I, I don't like it. Anything, cigarettes, weed, cigars. Cigars, they, they, ugh. they smell weird. Uh oh, I you mean, smoke cigars. No, <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Cigars. Mm -mm. I yeah, but a cigar uh, two or three times, and when I tell you, I got gravely ill. I mean, throwing up. But I don't understand the appeal of cigars. What is the appeal of cigars? I is think that is thing. I think well now what I think is um, it's trendy, and I know that women are going there because they know men are there. Men are doing it. Right. And I had a, a friend of mine who smoked cigars and he said, you know, men can't have nothing. You know, we go to the cigar bar to chill. To, okay. So our lady is OK with us being somewhere with the brothers smoking a cigar. Now, all of a sudden. No, you're right. Music in the cigar bar. They you know, the women, they have a ladies night in a cigar bar. And, and, he, and a lot of women seem to think that that's going to bring you closer to these men. But that's really not happening because a lot of them take it as you're invading their spaces. And I know like a lot of women are into football and basketball. But for, for a lot of guys, a lot of guys look at that as just generic. Like, you know, there are some women who are really into the sports. Yes. You know what I'm saying? But, but there are a lot of women who just do it just to, you know, be down with the guys and to be cool. So I just think sometimes it's a little too transparent. And men, we like our space. You know, we're deprived of it too often. <laughs> we like to have our space. It doesn't mean we don't want to be with you, but we like to have our space. So let the man have his space and his time. And I think that's a love language for men, being able to give them their space. Because we, we're like, like you said, we're emotional and not all of us. Some women don't, some women are not touchy and, you know, want to have that space. But a lot of us, or why you got to go out or where you going or I want to go with you or and it's like I believe that one of the love languages for men is a, a certain amount of space that they require to, yep. to keep their identity because right. I'm not just your man <laughs> sometimes you just need to decompress right no, no matter what listen life could be great you know you can wonderful but a man still needs that time to just decompress I'm sure you ladies need that too. You probably oh, yeah. other. You know other we ways. go on girls trips, but when if a, but that's the difference. We go on girl trips, but if a man says that, we think it's suspect. Like mm -hmm. they're going to sleep with women. Like right. We going on a fishing trip. What's fishing where? Like we our mind. And again, from our experiences of being hurt, and I try to teach the women that I coach that experiences are to teach us. Or for us right. to learn a lesson, not to and don't drag it into, into the something. next relationship and base right. those relationships on that previous trauma because all you're going to do is destroy that relationship and you're not even going to understand why. 
Right. Because you're like, oh, the last man I was with, he went fishing. They was they was actually out going to see girls. Now this man really fishing. Yeah. And you you blowing up his phone, you acting crazy. He like, what is going on? Because you had an experience with somebody else that was only supposed yes. to teach you that that wasn't the person for you. It wasn't supposed to mold you into your dating pattern. So I, I try to help the sisters out. What is your dream vacation? My dream vacation? Mm-hmm. It has to involve a beach and just me being on that beach. Oh. Nobody with me. Oh. My dream vacation is not a romantic vacation. <laughs> My dream vacation is for me to be able to get away from the rest of the world and be on a nice, be beautiful beach and have my and just have like my laptop or my pen and pad and I'm writing a screenplay I'm finishing I just need time I need peace and quiet and time you know everything is just so busy 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 and we just don't get rest especially as an entrepreneur it's very difficult to just take a break and I always say sometimes you got to step away in order to come back you know, and it's been a long time since I had a vacation. So for me, it's kind of like my dream vacation is to actually have a vacation. <laughs> well, but we're going to get you there. I'm going to hold you accountable to that. Like yeah, after, so. this, after this pandemic, because well, that, right. that put a little damper on some things, too, because it's a right. whole just going through the airport and all that. It's just crazy. Just stay home. Mm -hmm. um, what does your wife or the woman that you're with? have to contribute contribute or bring to the table she has to know how to cook she has to be cooperative because that's something that it seems a little far far in between now like getting cooperation from the woman that you're with and cooperation doesn't mean that i'm in charge and i i call all the shots but cooperation, we don't want to always be at battle. We don't always want everything to be an adversarial relationship. You know, cooperation, you know, support. You know, let's let's not let's not fight right now. You know what I'm saying? What else do I need? I need I need a woman. Wait, you said what? Yeah, I would like a woman who is goal oriented as myself. Now, I know a lot of people have these like these financial, these monetary requirements, but that's not really something that I I really have like that. I mean, I would as long as a woman is is like she's believes in working hard or whatever whether she works hard uh as a business owner, whether she works hard at her job, whether she works hard as a mother or stay at home home mom just someone that has that that work ethic that's what i'm talking about um and she has to be like a, a good mother got to be a good mother okay that's mm -hmm. okay what do you think about prenups nowadays i think it's sad that prenups have to be a thing nowadays because it has become very difficult to find real love and we're in such a materialistic world now and all the messaging is you know I put up a post today on Facebook and it said that unfortunately men many women today don't want a husband they want a sponsor and that caused a big stir. People cursing me out here and there, people agreeing, but everybody's in there arguing and fighting. But that's that's the that's that's where we are today in society. It's all about the money. That's it. It's all about what can you give me? What can you how much can you pay me almost? That's basically what it's it says. So I can understand how some men would be hesitant to. You know, but then again, for me, it's like if you decide to marry somebody, shouldn't you know that person well enough and trust them enough to even ask them to marry you? So I, I don't know. 
But right. then honestly, I'm at a place in my life and I know this is probably going to maybe turn some people off or upset some people. I just don't know at this time anymore if marriage is for me. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I have a more traditional sense of marriage. And let's face it, I'm not getting any younger. You know what I'm saying? And and I am, I'm not going to say I'm picky, but I'm particular. And I know what I want. And it can be a very frustrating world for people who know who they are and know what they want. And mm -hmm. I understand that we're all going to make certain compromises when we get into a relationship with someone, but you don't want to compromise to get into a relationship with someone. And that's where I found myself as of late, where if I want to get in a relationship with somebody, I'm going to have to compromise a lot of my desires and, and who I am. And just like I don't want to make you unhappy, I don't want to make myself unhappy. Especially with a 14-year-old who's going to be an adult in a few years, and then it's going to be just me. Right. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. I always ask about the prenup because I just think like if I have to, even if I'm the one and I'm I'm the woman and I'm a billionaire, if I have to ask a man for a prenup, I've already seen something that I don't trust. Exactly. So why am I marrying you? If I if I'm preparing for whatever you're going to do, right? You're preparing for the divorce. Right. So, so I'm like, why, why are you even getting married if you're setting up for the divorce? Right. So that was, you know, I asked this question. Maybe that, that should be just a, a, a part of the whole contract of marriage. So that way it's not even in your hands. I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? So that it's just a condition of the contract of marriage that there is a prenuptial arrangement. I, I don't know. But right. For me, right. Maybe that is it. Maybe maybe that. Because if if it if it comes to me and, and me and you were together, you asked me to sign a prenup. I don't. I don't. We're not getting married. Right. I don't want to marry you because you don't <laughs> trust me. So you want a prenup for what? What do you think I'm going to rob you? Like at the end of the day, what I must have shown you something in the content of my character that will make you think that you couldn't True. trust me. True. You're right. You know what? You're right because there are people that I know in my life. I'm not even with them in a relationship, but there are certain people I know, like if I married her and it didn't work out, I don't got to worry. You know right. what I mean? And what's so sad is that the best people for us sometimes, we're just not on that type of vibe with them. Like they're my, our friends or right. you know what I'm saying, because the right. best I know, I'm not attracted to them or I'm not, you know, romantically involved with them. Like right. people that you would probably think are the best women for me, but right. there has to be that attraction there, I guess. Let me not yeah, say, I I'm, guess no, it, it has to be that. I mean, so, cause there's something keeping you from going out of the friend zone. There's, there's something, you know what I'm saying? If I, it, like I have male friends that I wouldn't cross that line for whatever mm -hmm. reason. It, and sometimes maybe it's because we value them so much mm -hmm. that we wouldn't want to destroy what we have. By crossing the line. Yeah, but you know what? <sighs> no, nah, I don't think there are certain people. I don't know. Like in life, there are maybe two or three people you might come across in life, maybe where you know that those people, they are your 1000% ride or die, whether you are married, whether you're in a relationship or not. You know what I'm saying? Right. And you know, one of my closest friends used to be my girlfriend. Oh, okay. And I think that's another telltale. It's too bad that you find out how perfect this person is for you after the relationship doesn't work. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, there's no circle back. Okay. <laughs> that's that's a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother show. Yeah. I'm about to make up a whole nother, I'm about to go to a whole See how my creative mind just went back. I had a whole show on my head called Circle Back. Is we circling Yay. back, moving forward. See, this that's my I told you my creative mind just heard and saw this whole show. All right, you here right now. <laughs> you're right here, right now. And you don't want to circle back just because you feel like your options have expired. Woo! Because that wouldn't really do them justice either, you know? Oh, oh, 
we see now you're going somewhere tony stay here with me we don't, we don't looking for Boaz. We ain't on the circle back here. Oh, right, right, right. We're okay. going to talk about that on the back end when we finish here, but because that's, okay. that's good. So now I'm going to, oh, what is the biggest struggle with Generation X women? The biggest struggle meaning? When trying to date or being in a relationship with Generation X women. Dealing with insecurity jealousy oh mm -hmm. yeah yeah insecurity is probably the biggest struggle and i understand you know because you know when we reach a certain age as a woman things start to change and sometimes you even question how virile and attractive you are you know what i'm saying and especially when you see men in your age group running after these little these little girls all over the place so I can understand how sometimes that can make a woman feel um, unwanted. But I would also say that, you know, when you exude a certain amount of confidence, that energy follows you, you know, and it attracts a certain type of individual. And I think one of the biggest problems that we see is that a lot of women in the Gen X community They've invested too much time in seeking one particular type of man, or they're looking for one package, and they're ignoring the other 90% of good men that are out there. And we don't realize how much we, how much we, how we can find exactly what we're looking for in just something that we never thought that we'd even be attracted to. We're not even giving people the opportunity because we're gauging our preferences based upon something that is honestly fed to us by the, the main, the media, entertainment, society. And there's a lot of good men that are being overlooked that could provide you with a beautiful life. And you're just robbing yourself because you're still stuck chasing after that, that man who you're trying to fix or who doesn't exist. And you're you're crying over this spilled milk of oh this this guy they're going over there these men but what type of men are going over there who are these men why do you want to be with a man who's chasing after a twenty six year old woman anyway he's a grown ass man who that's not somebody that you need to be looking into anyway so I think it has a lot to do with the choices that we make. And, you know, and since we're talking about our women, the choices that you made that led you to where you are, where you're still looking at relationships through the same lens and denying yourself the opportunity to really see all the myriad of options that are still out there for you that you can really find happiness in. Wow. Ladies, I think that we have been schooled today i think we just i think tony didn't drop the hammer on some of our toes so okay. i'm gonna give you five words and i just want you to tell me what they mean to you okay. it could be a one word answer or it could be a sentence or a paragraph uh wealth wealth security mm -hmm. home family money evil <laughs> <laughs> legacy community children uh changing the world yes and the last one is life my kids i love it Thank you so much, Tony, for being here with me. I really enjoyed this candid conversation about life, love, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, you are tuned into Looking for Boaz. And the real question, my sisters, is are you ready to be Ruth? Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Peace and blessings. Mm -hmm.